not interesting for you, but what's interesting for me is how back-to-back -back these two presentations are and how completely different they are. So previously we talked about something maybe more useful, and now let's talk about something more sciencey. Uh, this is part of a Sindri project. So this is a, this is a relatively big project, uh, around 8 million pounds between uh, uh, University of Bristol and EDF Energy. And the, way, and, and, and the reason for doing this is we want to do everything now in silico. We don't want to do any more tests, so all the tests I talked about before, you, know, that you don't want to do any of that. It's all about next generation power plants. Let's, let's, just, let's just put everything into a computer model. So we want, we want to develop a really clever computer model that we can trust. And the reason we want to do that is because you might know that in the UK we have really, really old high temperature nuclear power plants. So they are working at around 100, 550, 525 degrees, and creep is really, really important for them. You can, you can, you know, this is this is how old they are. They they, they look really cool. You know, if you, you cannot go inside it anymore. You know, it's too hot now. But the days you could go inside, you know, it is a very complex geometry in there and they are working at 550 degrees, so they are well into the, their creep regime. You turn it on, it, it plastifies, you keep it working for a couple of years, it creep relaxes, and then you turn it off, the sections are so thick, you, you push them back to incompression, and then you turn them on again, and they come up again. You're, you're, you're putting a really demanding load on, on, your, on, your, on, your, on your power plant. So the question is, is it gonna break, or is it not gonna break? And, and, and of course, we can use the same methodology for generation four uh, power plants that are supposed to work for a uh, higher temperature. What we're doing here is we want to know, if I get a sample and I put it into a machine and I apply constant load on it at 550 degrees and I pull it, it breaks at a certain time, creep. If I unload it and then load it again, as a power plant does, two things happen to it. One is, you are um, uh, work hardening the material. So you're making your material tougher. And by doing that, you are inhibiting your creep deformation. At the same time, what you're doing is you are, you know, all the, all the grains inside it, they get pulled and pushed. Some of them are softer, some of them are tougher. You produce a residual stress field inside your material. And that residual stress field can be either helping your creep deformation or inhibiting your creep deformation. So when you get a sample and you just start pulling and pushing it like a power plant, you are putting a very complex condition on it. You are hardening it and you are slowing your creep down and at the same time you're putting residual stress in and you're, you're speeding up your creep. So the, the analysis is really complicated at the end. Is it gonna break or is it not gonna break? Is it the hardening that's more important and my creep is um, um, slower, or is it my residual stress that's important and my creep is faster? You know, you can imagine the Office of Nuclear Regulation would really like the cooperator to tell them when their component is going to break. And again, all power plants, if you want to keep them going, you have to be accurate. So the only way to, 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 to simulate that is, 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 is to do, go to the grain. So let's, let's simulate some, you know, with, a, with a simulation technique that can consider both the hardening and the residual stress between the grains. So the answer is obviously crystal acidifying element, which has been used for a very long time for deformation, and now we are starting to use it more and more and more uh, for forming, and we are using it more and more and more in nuclear industry. So the, for those of you who are, who are familiar with, with crystal plasticity, it's a, it, the concept is very, very simple. What it's saying is I get a hardening law, I get a slip law, and I get a hardening law. And um, uh, they're all defined in rates, but it's very much I pull something, if it goes plastic, it goes plastic, this is, this is the rate of deformation, and also it hardens. You can connect these to all your dislocation densities. Their fantastic work has been done in various places like Imperial College, that they go and do high resolution EBSD, calculate your GNDs, can, you know, estimate your SSDs, and put them into your crystal plasticity model, and you can make this uh, thing really complicated and physically informed. We don't want to do that. What we want to do is we want to produce something dirty and engineering to give us a quick answer about our power plant. So there is no SSD in here, there is no GND here. All it's saying is, I have some back stress, which means that I have some kinematic effect. I have some isotropic effect. And the contention is, my material, my dislocations cannot care less if they're doing plasticity or creep. If they're doing plasticity, they move fast and produce some, uh, produce some stresses in my material, deformation in my material. And if this creep 
the same dislocations with the same back stress at the same isotropic hardening and even the same critical redox shear stress, they do the deformation in creep. So it's smashing in the creep and plasticity together. That is, that is, that is what's behind this model. There is no difference between your fast plasticity and your very, very, very slow creep. Um, you have to put some length scale into your, into your, into your uh, crystal plasticity model. So, you know, Hall, Patch, God bless them. They have produced something really useful. You can just stick it in. Again, they are really clever techniques for putting, I mean, it, the, the reason that you need a length scale in your crystal plasticity is because you want to get the residual stresses right between the grains. Um, you can put something clever like a strain gradient in there, or you can just stick a hole patch into it. So what we have done is we have a stick a hole patch. L is the uh, mean free uh, uh, length between, 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 between the um, um, grain and its grain boundary. And the question was, first question, is our, is, our, is our model valid? So you go to your friends in University of Oxford and you tell them, could you please do this high resolution electron backscatter diffraction for me and calculate my stresses from your GNDs? They, they do all their amazing work and witchcraft happens and they give you a stress field. This is residual, this is, this is a stress field, elastic stress field in a tiny, tiny component that we have put into SEM, have done high resolution ABSD on it, pulled it, have done high resolution ABSD on it, then got the GNDs, calculated the residual stress, got rid of it, put it into a, um, a cross-core uh, software and it spits out different stress states. And then you compare your model with your measurement in one grain or in a number of grains. You know, if you're a proper scientist, which I'm sure you are, you say this is crap. You know, your model is saying this and your experiment is going da 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 da. Um, you'd be right if you wanted to look at exactly what happens on the microstructure. Again, dirty engineer. Well, all I'm caring about is, look, they're actually the same order of magnitude. So I'm pretty happy about my residual stresses. Considering the variability in my material, there is so much variability, there is no point in getting it right on every single grain. So it's not a bad model, not a validated, amazing model, but it's not a bad model. And then you can go and get a um, um, RVE. You look at the material, it's not that textured, so you put the uh, average grain size in it, you put almost no texture into it, and then you get really, really clever people, and you ask them, could you please stick this material into this machine? This is a, this is a big hunk of steel, unlike the ABSD sample. Uh, heat it up to 225 degrees, cycle it at 2.5%, and then creep it at 200 megapascals. These are, these are really big loads, by the way. And then what happens is you do three samples. One is, let's just creep it as it is. You get the green line. L the other one is, let's pull it and then creep it. So that's this guy. And then the other one is, let's push it and then pull it and then do a creep. So it's trying to put residual stresses and um, hardening into material at the same time to simulate that really complex condition that your power plant can see. You would expect this to be there when you're pulling it, then creeping it to be there, but when you're pushing it and then creeping it, this guy to be on top of the other two, but it's not, it's coming down. What it means is the hardening I have made in here is strong enough to overcome the residual stresses. So my residual stresses that accelerate creep are more inhibited than how much the uh, hardening is stopping my creep. And then you do an honest to God calibration of your model, which means that you go and do a cyclic test and turn off your creep uh, bit and you calibrate your model. Then you turn off your creep bit, do a, a, a creep test, calibrate your model. Then you tell it, go and predict a combination of both. And it's surprisingly good to the point that you ask the student, tell me where did you fiddle with the data to get this good uh, um, 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 agreement? She tells me she hasn't. So that tells me that it's not important what the model is correct or not. You can get any model to do anything it wants. What's important is the original hypothesis was correct, which is you can combine your creep and your plasticity 
that means that you can do your analysis based on just plasticity, and hopefully the Office of the Regulation accept that. And that's my conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you.